All right, everyone, welcome to the last GoLab talk of the day. We're about to watch the talk called Advanced Dependency Management in Go Using FX by Preslav Mikhailov. Let's bring him live really quickly just to say hi while I read his biography. Hey there, welcome. Glad you could join us. Hey, nice to hear you and see you, Latara. Thanks for introducing me. Of course, um, my pleasure. Oh, yeah. you, you were about to say? Uh, yeah, I was going to say that I um, hope you guys enjoy the talk. Um, I really focus on making it quite practical and impactful, meaning that um, I, I I hope that after this you see something which you can apply to your day-to-day uh, -day work or side project right out of the bat. And it's also impactful, meaning that, um, well, it does um, change the way you deal with your project, or it might, you know, aid you in your upcoming year-end review in whatever company you're working for. So have fun, enjoy, and I'm here for to answer any questions. Awesome, thanks for that. So let me just uh, read your bio and about the talk, and then we'll get started. So Preslav here is a software engineer at Uber, working with microservices written in Go and Java. He has also been teaching programming since 2015, leading lectures and seminars on various topics from the programming world to both aspiring programmers and experienced developers alike from uh, Bulgaria, Serbia, Australia, Singapore, the Philippines, and more. Uh, topics range from the basics of programming to data structures, algorithms, web development, and even blockchain. In his free time, he's maintaining To Do Check, which is a tiny linter written in Go, which connects your to dos to your tasks in your issue tracker. Very cool. So uh, in this talk, Preslov will show us how to handle complex dependency graphs in Go using the FX framework. It can make your life easier in many regards, but its greatest value is in the way it enables you to modularize, modularize and share your infrastructure code across multiple microservices. The talk focuses on introdu introducing the concept of dependency introduction injection and its implementation in Go using the FX framework. Apart from providing a dependency injection mechanism, this framework enables you to separate your application into distinct independent modules, which can be shared across multiple code bases. This is especially valuable in a microservice environment where every service has a lot of boilerplate infrastructure code, which has to be present on any service regardless of its business logic. In a typical microservice architecture, every service needs some kind of health check, an ELK monitoring client, tracing clients, and various other integrations specific to your server environment. By extracting this common piece of software in a module, which can be plugged in and reused across services using FX, one can greatly reduce development time and maintenance costs as you'd need to deal with a wiring infra only once and reuse that across your code base. So without further ado, let's go ahead and watch the video and um, everyone enjoy. If you do have any questions for Preslov, we're going to save them to the very end so he can answer them live. So please direct your questions to the chat, um, which is with the question mark. It looks like the help button, but it's not, it's the Q&A. So uh, please have your questions there and then we'll, we'll save them for the end. So thanks, enjoy the show. Uh, my name is Preslav Mikhailov and today I'm giving you the talk named Advanced Dependency Management in Go using FX. So first to get things started, what's this, what's this all about? Um, now today we'll cover if you're a Go developer and you are working in an environment where you're making uh, complex code bases with a lots of dependencies going around, a lot of components which you have to juggle then this might be useful to you. And second, if you're also 
working in an environment where you maintain a lot of microservices, then today I'm going to show you some techniques and tools which can help you um, leverage microservice reusability a lot more, manage microservices easier, and in, in some it will reduce the development time spent maintaining your microservices a lot. Uh, because I'll show you how to manage your dependencies in a, in a very scalable way, which is which also happens to be quite reusable. So let's get started. Um, first, let me introduce myself. I am Preslav. I'm a software engineer at Uber from Bulgaria, um, where I'm currently working as a Go and Java software engineer. Uh, we are maintaining several services, and what I am uh, demonstrated today is a tool which we actually use daily and has helped us a lot but it isn't widespread um, and I think that it, it might be of help to many other people as well it's fully open source it's available anyone can use it but there isn't a, enough awareness about it and people tend to solve this problem in different ways which I, I, I think they're suboptimal apart from that I've been a technical trainer and speaker for um, around six years now. Um, I've started training uh, programming basic courses in Bulgaria, but later I've also led some more advanced courses in other countries such as Serbia, Singapore, Australia, um, and, and there are other also countries I've been to as well. And I, I've also made other conference appearances as well, um, mostly in Bulgaria, and today I'm, I'm making this conference in Italy, uh, but but probably there aren't all, there aren't only people from Italy here. Um, I also maintain a blog. Uh, you can check it out, and I also maintain several open source projects. But that's not the uh, highlight of this talk, of course. Um, just uh, put I put it out out there. Um, and yeah, let, let's get started with the actual stuff you are interested in and what's upcoming for this um, lecture well first i'll show you how you typically manage dependencies when when you don't have a to the tool which i'm going to show you um, how you handle dependencies by using manual wiring we'll see what's that and how it's used and why it's used why it's necessary then we'll take this a step forward and I'm going to introduce you to the FX frameworks which can help you manage your dependencies via dependency injection. Um, if you are familiar with dependency injection in other languages like C Sharp or Java, then this might be quite familiar to you actually because it's an equivalent technology but in the Go space. Finally, I'm going to show you perhaps the greatest feature of this thing which is how you can structure your code into reusable modules, which can be used across multiple microservices. In the beginning of the talk, I, I shared with you that if you're working in a microservice environment, this talk can be great to be useful to you. And this part of the lecture is the exact reason why, because that's probably the greatest benefit this framework gives you. It allows you to share um, components, which you typically use across all your services very, very easily. But we'll get to that later. First, we'll start with how you typically handle component dependencies via manual wiring. Now, first, let me um, lay out there what manual wiring is. It means manually injecting your dependencies. First, one question might arise, why do you inject dependencies? Um, second, why you do it manually, which I actually want to show you how to do it automatically instead. But first, let me in explain. Why do you inject dependencies? So this comes from this concept of dependency injection, which was originally introduced, I believe, by Martin Fowler, where the, the thing is that when you have a certain component, it typically has some dependencies. Like, let's say you have a component which uh, exposes some endpoints, which, you know, HTTP clients can uh, get post, put, delete from them. And that component will need a dependency, which is the HTTP client it used. Another component, let's say managing users, some kind of a user controller might need 
have a dependency on the user database. Uh, and and do, all those stuff are different components which rely on other components in order to function properly. Uh, and dependency injection injection is the act of not wiring your components directly in the source code of your dependent components, but accepting the dependencies as um, typically constructor parameters or in Go, you typically accept them in the new function. Uh, which you typically have for you all your uh, class-like components but we'll get to that now uh, i'll actually show you an, a real demo of how this works so here i've created this simple project which demonstrate uh, demonstrates a web app um, and it has several components it's really simple it has a main http handler and config the config is simply some configuration you typically have in your web application like what port it uses but in a real application you can also have other stuff like um, for example some set of block listed users for some reason you might have some endpoints you're connecting to what port to search for some dependent services etc but i'm keeping things simple in order to you know make this as digestible as possible and yet still get the concept. The other component is the HTTP handler, which is a component which exposes a hero um, endpoint, which is actually the root endpoint as you he see here. Now, what this component does and the whole application, what it does, it, it actually doesn't do anything interesting, but the interesting stuff is how it's structured. Notice how here the HTTP handler has two dependencies. One is the servmux, which is the um, which is the structure it uses to register its routes correctly, um, and then you have the logger, which it uses to log some stuff people are interested in, like um, how many times a certain endpoint is involved, for example. Now this is an example of dependency injection. Here you have your components not directly initialized inside the function but instead they're provided as function parameters um, an alternative to dependency injection is doing something like um, instead of passing the logger here you write something like logger or zap dot new logger or something like that whatever the syntax is doesn't matter right now so that's the alternative like um, initializing your dependencies directly in your component, but typically that's, that's being condemned as bad practice in uh, web development due to that notion of dependency injection. And why is that? Well, when you inject your dependencies, you make your components easier to test um, because let's say you have a dependency on the user database and you wanna test that your controller when he has the right input to create a new user correctly creates a user um, if you don't inject your dependencies and directly instantiate your dependencies inside the user controller um, then you won't be able to mock the database and uh, you have to actually spin it a real database off in order to test your uh, things but by using dependency injection, you can actually provide the database interface as a parameter. And in your real application, you provide a real database, but in your tests, you provide some kind of a mock, which makes things a lot easier. So that's dependency injection in a nutshell, um, but it uh, has some downsides. And the downsides of dependency injection can be seen in the main function. Here I have this big main function, which actually isn't so big because the application is relatively small. But what you typically do in your uh, main function is you initialize all your components, you wire them around. What, what I mean by wiring them around is this. Like, for example, imagine, see how the logger here is initialized. Zap.new production creates a new logger. It, you do the error handling and stuff. And finally, you pass the logger to the component which needs it. The HTTP server mux is handled uh, in a similar way, etc. etc. Now, here I have only one main component which makes this a lot easier to digest. But when you have a big application, you will have a lot of this code. You will have a lot of 
component initializing, passing those components around, making copies of them if you don't want to share the same instance across everything, etc, etc, which can be quite the boilerplate. It, it um, consumes a lot of development time for big projects. Um, I recently had to do this. I had this, um, uh, we have this service which uses dependency injection and I just wanted to create a simple script which uses reuses one single class from the whole service. But in order to initialize that class, I had to create a function which was around 50 lines long in order to initialize a single class. Why is that? Because that class was dependent on component X. Component X on the other hand is dependent on component Y. Component Y has dependencies on something else. So I had this huge chain of dependencies which I had to initialize manually myself. Um, later, a colleague of mine came and said, hey, you, you can actually just reuse the dependency injection here and just say, provide me the dependencies. Once, you, once I did that, that um, function was uh, reduced to two lines. So um, that's the power a dependency injection framework gives you, which is actually my next point, which we'll get to now. Uh, before we get to that, my point is that this manual wiring can get tedious at some point. Uh, the alternative to manual wiring is not using dependency injection, which would make initializing your components a lot easier, but it would make them harder to test and couple to um, lower level components than themselves, uh, which which not a good architectural practice, but that we can talk about, we can discuss that later, for example, in the Q&A section, if anyone's interested. Um, and the other alternative to manual wiring is using some kind of framework which helps you deal with all this on your own. And that's what we'll talk about next. So I'll, I'll show you um, how to use the FX framework in Go to manage your dependencies. And first, let's recap what's the pros and cons of this. Now, when you use manual wiring, the one of the big things is that code is easier to understand because although the main function is quite big and it's quite deep boilerplate, it is easy to understand because it's simple code. It doesn't use any magic. It doesn't use any reflection. It doesn't use uh, any complex technologies in order to get stuff spinning you can expect any beginner to be able to understand that code. Um, however, the problem with this is that when you get a big enough project, it becomes very hard to maintain and your code gets very, very hairy uh, quite quickly. Um, and another thing is, this is specific for a microservice environment. Now, imagine you have five microservices which do different stuff but they all depend on some common baseline components which it has to set up. For example, health checks, integration with your logging system, integration with your metric system, integration with alerts, integration with, um, you know, the whatever other infrastructure your service needs. All this thing, you <laughs> we imagine you, when you create a new service, instead of Reusing that, you have to either copy paste it and adjust for your code base, or you have to do it uh, from scratch, which makes creating new services a lot harder than it should be. And uh, that that's one of the bigger problems, in my opinion, of this approach. So what is the alternative? Well, as I said, one of the alternative is using a dependency injection framework. And FX is such a framework. Um, and it is a dependency injection application framework. So let, let's let's understand what, what I just said. So a dependency injection framework, the first two words of the whole um, you know, word storm is means that this is a framework which does the component wiring for you. So you don't have to deal with knowing, okay, uh, I have an HTTP handler, I need a logger. Where do I get this logger from? You don't need to care about that. The DI framework will take care of that for you as long as you provide a logger somewhere, a logger instance. And what is an application framework? It means an application framework is one that manages the entire application lifecycle. 
rather than it being a plugin used library. So what does that mean? It means that in very basic notion, the flow of control passes from the framework to your application, not the other way around. Um, what, what, what does this mean in practice? Well, the framework can do a lot of stuff behind the scenes without your consent, uh, which is good for some use cases. With a library, if you, let's say, want to um, use make a connection to a database using GORM, for example, uh, that's a library, you have to import it somewhere. You have to call some function or implicitly call some init function somewhere in order to use it. So you have to explicitly say that you're using some library and you have to pass it the input parameters in order for it to work. But with an application framework, it has more power than a simple library and I'll show you how you can leverage that uh, later in the talk. So what does it do? Now, this, this is the same for any dependency injection framework, by the way. So it's, you know, dependency injection frameworks 101. Um, and the, the simplest way to explain it, the simplest thing it does is it pr manages providers and receivers. A provider is a component or a class which says, here's an instance of this component, of this structure, of this class, whatever you, whatever you prefer. Use it as you please. And receivers say, hey, in order to work, I need instances of components X, Y, Z. Please provide them to me. Um, for example, the HTTP handler can be a good candidate for a receiver because um, in the HTTP handler here, let me open it really quickly, you have the new function which says, hey, in order for me to work, I need the serve mux and the logger. Um, without it, I can't really function properly. So that's a receiver. Uh, but on the other hand, the uh, HTTP handler is also a provider because it says, hey, here's an instance of the handler structure. Use it as you please. Um, so so th those are two examples of providers and receivers. In this case, one component could be both, um, and which is very often seen in you know, application. It's very typical. Um, and what this framework does for you is to connect providers to receivers for you. So if we are doing it manually, like in the main function here, we say, hey, I need a new provide, I need you to provide me a logger. And then I take this logger and pass it to the receiver, which is the HTTP handler. This code is managed for you by FX if you're utilizing the framework. So that's, that's what the framework does for you. And we'll see an example of that right now. Um, in order to see that, I will show you. Uh, first, I'll go to another branch which has the refactor code which uses FX, and here's how it looks. So, we'll first, concentrate on the main function only. When you use FX, this is the way you typically use it. It's a library. Uh, here is actually how it looks like. It's go.uber.org slash FX. You can look it up. Um, and you create a new set of providers and receivers and you click run, uh, you invoke run actually. Um, so this provide and invoke stuff um, are actually some details which you can look up about what's the difference between the two. That's not important right now. The important thing is that here you say, hey, I have a function called provide config, which is a provider function. It, it knows how to create a instance of the config structure. It actually does it by reading a file, unmarshalling it, etc, etc. Um, then you have provide logger, which knows how to provide a logger. It uh, creates a new production logger and uh, it mm, wraps it in some sugared version of it, etc. Um, here's a new serve mux which is also a provider. It creates a new instance of the server structure, etc. And then you have the HTTP handler dot new function, which is a receiver. It says, hey, I need a server and I need a logger to work. But nowhere in this code am I saying I am invoking this function directly. Nowhere am I saying invoking the function directly. Uh, I just I just tell the framework, I have this function, it needs this stuff to work, take care of that. And what the function does for you uh, is it finds all the providers which 
give you these stuff like the server mugs, the logger, which are provided actually by the provide logger function and the new server mugs. It takes them, bundles them, and passes it to your function for you. Now, uh, that way you actually avoid writing the code which wires those dependencies around. That's why it's called the dependency injection framework because the dependencies are managed exquisitely um, for you and you need not bother with this anymore. And for a small application like this, it actually um, seems a bit of an overkill and it's true. It's that for small applications, I wouldn't advise using something like that because any framework, any additional dependency you add to your um, project complicates matters, um, which is why I only suggest using that if you really need it. And when do you really need it? When you have a big enough project to at some point say, oh my God, I'm tired of all this manual wiring. You, you feel when that moment has. So that's one, uh, one use case when you'd consider using FX. The other thing is when you have microservices and you wanna share pieces of components across several services, this can also help you. And this is actually the next part of the presentation, which we'll get to. For now, I want you to understand that um, this framework gets these functions, which provide instances of some structures and pass them around to other functions, which accept such instances. Um, and in the end, your application works just as before, um, but you are avoiding the, you, you don't have to write a lot of the code you typically write to wire these components around. Okay, so, so that's e a dependency injection framework, an example of it, that's how you use it. Um, it's really, really similar to, um, let's say, Java's Juice framework. If you've used that, it will be very familiar because it uses the same um, concepts, like in Juice you have providers and receivers, you re you really use it the same way. It just has a few more annotations which make it a bit more sophisticated, but it also provides even more overhead. FX is actually pretty white weight and it doesn't get in the way. Um, so what what's the benefits of all this? Well, as I told you and showed you, when you wire component wiring is handled for you, which is makes it much easier. You don't have to write a lot of the code you typically have to write. I already gave the example where in my project I had to use one, a single class from the bigger service and in order to initialize it I needed a 50 line function for a single class. Um, with By reusing the dependency injection framework I, I had two lines of code instead of you know 50, uh, which, which was great. And this is what FX can do for you in Go as well. So if you write less code, that means less work, which is great. Uh, it reduces development time. Um, instead of focusing on unimportant stuff like wiring your dependencies, you can focus on more important matter like actually implementing your business rules correctly. Um, it also enables creating reusable modules. Um, which we'll step on in the next part of the presentation. But the bad thing about dependency injection frameworks is that they're kind of quirky and hard to grasp for newcomers. Um, if you've never used a dependency injection framework like that, um, then you need some time to onboard. You probably need to watch a lecture like this um, to to get acquainted with uh, what FX is and how to use it. And it's also making debugging apps a, a slightly more, slightly harder because now you're using a framework which manages one part of your code for you. And when you want to trace where an instance is used, um, it's a bit harder because you don't have a direct dependency to the, the place where the instance is used. For example, if you um, have the, um, let's say the provide logger function and you wanna see, hey, wh where is this instance of sugar logger actually used? If you try to search via your ID and say, find all references of this, 
you typically not get the results you expect because you actually you're actually providing this function to the um, FX framework, not to some of your code directly. So um, it, it's a skill you you actually develop to do. You get used to that and you handle this um, burden. But it, it is an overhead you have to manage. You have to take into consideration. Okay. And finally, the best part about this whole framework um, is that it enables you to reuse a lot of your code across different code bases in a very, very efficient and easy way. I'll show you how. Now, there's this thing called FX modules, which allow you to extract code into independent packages and independent layers. So, what an FX module is, is a bundle of providers and receivers. That's, that's all it is. It's a bundle of providers and receivers, which you can package in some library to reuse directly. Um, and that, that's actually pretty convenient. You'll see how it's actually used. Uh, the greatest benefit of this is when you use them in a microservice environment. Because as I already said at some point, uh, when you have several microservices, you typically have a big overhead in terms of infrastructure. Um, because if you have a single service, let's say a single huge monolithic Java service, um, you have a certain piece of your code base which handles integration with your logging system, integration with uh, your metrics, integration with some authentication system which is re reused across your company etc etc um, which you know that piece par part of the code base is hard to understand and kind of hairy but at least it's only you know it's isolated and it's in one place when you have several microservices you have to now um, share that hairy code base across all your microservices because any microservice no matter what it, its business rules are, need some kind of logging. They need access to your authentication. Um, they need access to your metrics and they need access to the standard way you structure configuration files, etc., etc. So all this stuff, you now have to find a way to reuse efficiently. And the least efficient way to do it is to copy paste the code. You, you copy some piece of code and you put it in several microservices. That's one way. The other way is whenever you create a new microservice, you have a checklist. And the checklist says first, before you move on with this, you have to um, set up your logging. This is the guide how you do it. You have to integrate with your authentication. This is the guide to do it. You have to set up uh, configuration files. This is how you do it, etc., etc. And as you might imagine, this makes developing new microservices very, very hard because every time you do it, you have to do something uh, from scratch, which other than simply making things harder to do and absorbing more time, other than that, it's also hard to maintain. Imagine that at some point, someone in your infrastructure team wants you to change the way you integrate with your logging infrastructure you are migrating from um, some logging infrastructure a to logging infrastructure b in order to do that you need some changes in your code base and now instead of changing this in one place you have to go to all your microservice owners and ask them to migrate individually which which is a huge burden uh, those kinds of projects are quite hard to um, do properly and it consumes a lot of money for the company and a lot of your time and now today i'm going to show you how to tackle this efficiently using the framework i just showed you so as i told you any service needs some kind of baseline infrastructure um, and this is a visual example like you have three services dealing with three very very distinct stuff but all three of them need some kind of infrastructure now when you use fx modules you can structure your way in such a way that all your infrastructure which i just told you about 
is encapsulated in a single module which can be plugged in any service you use. And FX can help you achieve that very, very easily as you soon see. Um, I'll, I'll show you right now. So, in order for this example to demonstrate that, I'll go to my final branch, which is FX modules. And voila, this is my whole main function. Previously, it had more stuff. Now it has five lines. Um, and the, the rabbit hole here, the magic here happens in this my company fx.module package. Now, module first is a, an identifier you, you you it's a simple go identifier it's a simple um instance of some object which you create and name however you like but typically the convention is to write it module because it's it makes you know the usage very clear and easy to understand um in uber for example when we have these kinds of components with which bundle FX modules, we name them like that. We have the instance of the package name module and the package name has the FX suffix. That way you know that you're dealing with an FX module here. And what an FX module is, is it's a bundle of other uh, FX modules and also providers and receivers. This means that you can recursively hierarchically structure your modules in a way that um, different teams can contribute to different modules and in the end you can encapsulate all their um, contribution in a single module which can be used. For example, I told you about configuration, about logging, about health checks, about all those stuff you typically need in your infrastructure. Um, previously you had to manage that yourself. Now you can have these FX modules, which are nothing more than a bundle of provider function. This is the provide config I, did, I previously showed you. Logger FX is the provide logger um, package, which I previously showed you. HTTP FX provides a new servmux, etc. So now you structure your package at a single location. And when you create a new function, Hmm. I have to restart this probably in order to see the new structure. When you create your new function, uh, your new service, you don't have to mm, you don't have to know what infrastructure you need. All you have to know is that you have to pass this my company FX module here, and you have all the infrastructure for you. What is my company FX? It's uh, module which simply encapsulates the configuration the logger and the http fx module it also has this register hooks function provided here which actually starts your server and um, closes the logger when your application closes um, and now having this thing you can say the following you have logger fx my company fx HTTP fx config fx all this stuff you can take them extract them into a separate go package managed by your infrastructure team and all you have to do is you say to your microservice owners whenever you create a new microservice simply use fx framework number one second use my company fx dot module of course my company fx can be renamed to whatever your company's name is in Uber, this package is called UberFX, but this is the exact same way that package is managed. And what does this provide you? Well, when you create your microservice, you've written two single lines of code, um, but now you have help checks, you have integration with logging, you have integration with metrics, you have integration with configuration files. All these stuff are already up given to you out of the box. All you have to do is use them, which saves a lot of development time anytime you create a new microservice. And it makes maintaining this a lot easier because now, since this is in a separate package, imagine that at some point they want to migrate your health check endpoints from slash help to slash help check. All they have to do is update the library and ask everyone to, you know, 
upgrade the library and now all the services are compliant out of the box without the service owner needing to do anything else other than updating their library which is uh, which is great and that's how these FX modules can help you scale your microservices quite well this is the exact same way all the microservices that, that you were have scaled so well because there are a lot and for all the microservices we have if we had to go through this um, exercise to do the infrastructure from scratch it, it will take yeah it will take a huge amount of time and it's it's just not worth it now you have a single team managing just your infrastructure and your microservice uh, focus teams can focus on their own uh, business rules and what whatever their you know their services made to do so that's how fx can help you um, manage your dependencies very easily um, and one more thing to remark here is that this this is different from a simple library because the difference i already said that but now you have more context to understand this uh, with a library you have to explicitly pass the flow of control from your application to the library for example with gorm when you initialize the library you have to somewhere call gorm.initialize or do some kind of import statement in order to make the library do its magic with fx modules all you need to do is you need to have the fx framework and you have and you need to pass the module to it and and from there fx takes the flow of control for you and um, does all its stuff if the if these modules were libraries for example in if i go to my company fx this register hooks function which um, starts your server and all those stuff you typically have to either call this explicitly or do it yourself uh, with fx this is done behind the scenes and you you don't even see how your server is started but it but it does start you, you don't have to manage that um, so so that's the difference here um, that's the main difference since the flow of control is, is managed by fx because it's an application framework um, it has more power and one of the ways it leverages that power is by allowing you to achieve this level of reusability which which is great for microservice developers so that's fx modules in a nutshell um, i'll i'll provide you some references in a bit first to summarize now manual wiring which i showed you in the beginning works quite well for small to medium-sized apps um, if you're not managing a horde of microservices uh, and if your application is small enough you, you shouldn't bother with any kind of framework like this because any framework is an overhead and i'm a huge proponent of keeping things as simple as possible and only using framework if you need it if you get to a large enough project and or you use microservices then fx can 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 count here um, a dependency injection framework allows you to scale your service when it has more components again this makes sense for microservices and big um, applications and finally those fx modules i showed you in the end allow different microservices to reuse the common dependencies um, and it allows you to create boundaries across your application which i haven't touched upon because i don't have enough time to cover this but it's a very um basically natural way to create boundaries and which allow you to um, structure your application very well in terms of maintenance even if you're not using microservices so so that's that's one great thing now if you want to take this a step further i've created two articles which go through the stuff i just showed you but you called them from scratch so if you you if you're a bit afraid of the fx syntax you're not familiar with its api then this is the place to go uh, because here you get familiar with it it they go into a lot more detail than this talk about how the api works exactly my goal was to share the concept and how it can how you can leverage it in your own use cases but if you want to um, start using it then this is the next step here in order to get familiar 
Finally, if you um, are interested in how it's done in Java uh, with the Juice framework, which I already mentioned, which is a framework created by Google, you can check out the um, video link here. I'll also make sure the, these references are attached to the um, video or I'll provide them later in the Q&A so that you, know, you, you have access to them directly. You need not send emails around to get them. All right, and, and that was it from me. Um, it was great to have you all today. And from now, I think we can move on to the Q&A and I'm, I'm waiting to, for your um, questions. You know, and I'll be happy to answer anything you're interested in. All right, well, we are welcoming all of you after that video, and we're just about to bring Preslav here to answer some questions. We have one so far. You guys, you can ask more questions for Preslav, that's okay. Let me bring you on live. Welcome. Hi, hi, sorry, hi. let me turn the lights on. <laughs> oh, no problem, <laughs> no problem at all. Yeah, I didn't notice that it became dark at some point. Sure, sure, it's fine. You know, we have all these technical things that can go wrong during conferences. No biggie if the light's a little low. Um, so anyway, thanks for your talk. That was awesome. Um, do you have anything you've wanted to add before we head on into the questions that are coming in? Yeah, uh, thanks. So um, first, hope you enjoyed that. And I really hope that it's, it's useful to you in your specific domain. Um, that, that's my goal. I said it from the start. I believe that knowledge is useful. Knowledge is impactful when put to use, when put to practice. So um, hopefully this talk contributed um, for that. Apart from that, I wanted to mention that I shared in the chat um, a link to the slide deck so that you can review it later. The slide deck contains the links you, I showed in the end, which are basically two tutorials which you can get your hands on um, with using FX because you see, I personally learn best by applying stuff myself, tinkering with them on my own. Uh, I'm sure that many of you feel the same way. That's why as a supplement to this talk, you can check out the tutorials so that um, you get your hands dirty with this if you're interested and you found it uh, useful. Apart from that, the third link, which is a uh, talk made by Google on a similar framework in Java um, is shared there as well, which is quite useful. There they go in a bit more detail about what dependency injection is, um, why it's needed, what alternatives you have, etc. cetera, which I didn't touch upon in this talk. So could be useful to you as well. Fantastic, thank you for that. Lots of resources for you all to, to tinker around with. Awesome, all right. Well, I think we'll go ahead and take a look at the questions for now. Uh, so the first one is from Giovanni Bartolomeo who says, um, what is the overhead impact of this dependency injection framework in the general performance of the project? All right, yeah, that's, that's a very nice question, Giovanni. Um, so basically the impact in terms of components for any dependency injection framework is that it makes your application boot up time slightly longer. So it takes uh, a little more time to start up. Um, but in my experience, it, it, it isn't really m very impactful. It, it doesn't bring much impact on the performance, especially for web projects, as long as it's not, it's not you know, five or 10 minutes or whatever, uh, it boots up in second. And second, the framework itself, uh, it's actually optimized in a way that I didn't mention this because I wanted to keep things succinct. Um, but the way it manages your dependencies is that you get all your constructors and functions, providers and receivers invoked only if you really need them. So if you, let's say, have your big module called My Company FX, um, and you have maybe 20 modules in there, which could be useful to some, some microservices, 
Um, probably not all the modules there will be of use to you. For example, some specific service might not need the logging um, module or might not need anything else. In that case, the framework will not invoke that function at all. So it will only provide those functions which you explicitly reference in your code base. Otherwise, it, it won't uh, it won't invoke them. Meaning that there there is no um, there isn't much performance in impact if you stuff a lot of dependencies which some people might need the framework will take care of that for you awesome thank you for that uh we have about three questions so far left next one comes from sanchit who says is there a way to add specific uh, service specific dependencies along with the common ones yes yes that that there is a way and it's actually the common way you you use the framework. Um, in the app I showed you, um, there was the main function, which only has a single module there provided, which is my company effects.module. But in a typical scenario where you actually have your service, um, you can include with separated by commas all the other modules you have. That, that's, that adds up to the thing I mentioned where uh, this thing pr allows you to create very nice boundaries across your applications um, because when you structure your application in modules, which can be reused, um, it's much more easier and uh, it comes natural to create the so much needed interfaces wherever you need them, let's say on the database layer or um, whatever other gateway layer you might have, etc. Um, so, so yeah, th there is a way. Um, it, it's not hard, actually. You just create your own module, uh, just like my company FX is created. You create your own module using the same syntax and all, and you provide it. And of course, there is, there are alternative way uh, alternative ways to structure your application. You can just stuff all the FX related things in a single file. I've actually seen this used uh, in one of our services. I'm personally not. Um, proponent of that because I feel that every module, every component can uh, just have a single package called your module FX and it can contain the FX related stuff. This is quite helpful also if in the future you want to migrate to another framework or change it or remove it altogether. If you find that it doesn't bring value, then you can just remove those FX uh, suffix parts of your um, application, which which makes uh, which which makes you very decoupled from the framework, which is really nice. This is not the same, let's say, in Java, uh, typically in a Java project, because in a Java project, you typically have all your annotations like add inject uh, all around your classes. And if at some point you want to migrate from, let's say, Spring to Juice or the other way around, um, you, you're going to have a hard time doing that because every single class in your system is in, impacted. So the framework is deeply ingrained in, in your application. All right, thank you for that. Awesome, yeah, sounds like a good answer. Let's go to uh, the next question here from Elon, who says, I am guessing FX has a chain of dependencies, which has dependencies, which has dependencies, yeah. which may have bugs uh, and updates, et cetera increasing the hidden surface area. I guess this is what you mean by making it harder to debug and trace too. Oh, all right, so so yes, every every module might have bugs, um, just like any library can have uh, bugs as well. That, that's natural, you, know, you really can't avoid that. Hopefully, you know, the library owner will take care of that if you have an internal library. Uh, but what I meant by making it harder to trace and debug, uh, apps is that when you use providers and receivers, your, let's say, new function for a given component is not used directly in the component which needs it, but it's provided to the FX framework. So let's say you want to find where is the HTTP handler being used? What, what is using this at all? And you click in your ID, find all usages of the new function, and you only find a single usage, which is where you provide it to the FX framework. At that point, you will have to um, probably use full text search and search for references of the identifier itself. So, so that's the part which makes it harder to trace because you can't follow along the dependency chains yourself because FX encapsulates that for you. That's the part which is hidden and it's kind of a magic, uh, which which uh, 
makes it harder to trace and debug. Now there are alternatives. Nowadays there are F and dependency injection frameworks which work with code generation rather than reflection. FX works with reflection. But there's another framework which um, I can't recall the name right now. Uh, it was created by Google. Um, and the way that it basically does the same thing as FX, but it generates the code for you so you can trace the stuff. However, I personally am not really a fan of that because the generated code is kind of um, hairy on its own. So I prefer not seeing that at all and not committing it to my project. All right, thank you. Yeah, and some I just saw that someone mentioned that Wire is the library by Google. Thanks, thanks for that. That was the exact Perfect. one I looked for. Great, thank you. All right, um, our next question, another one from Sanchit, who says, is there a way to add specific dependencies along with the common ones? For example, if you create a common handler that's shared across different microservices, but um, there are specific things unique to each handler. Um, sorry, let, let me just read the question again. Sure, it's, uh, it's in the Q&A here. Yeah, nice, yeah. Oh, okay, sorry, it's the same one. Okay, um, so is there a way to ask service specific? Okay, so it, it's kind of, this question is kind of similar to uh, the previous one. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It was, um, it, it's different. What well, my interpretation of, of it is that, um, is there a way to, let's say, change the input to a given, um, let's say, uh, module so that it acts in a different way based on what service is using it? That that's That's how I'm interpreting it. Mm -hmm. um, and the answer is yes, you could structure it like that. Um, now, the, the the way you could do that is you can make the module re receive some kind of, need some kind of dependency, which is not provided on its own. And if you try to use such a module, uh, FX will throw an error because it will say, um, well, there's this module for it to work. It needs um, an instance of a logger, for example which is not, it doesn't come out of the box. In that case, what you have to do is you have to create the instance of the logger in your service and then provide it. And that that's totally possible. Um, that's the way you would do it with FX. Um, in my opinion, it's not ideal because you don't, you don't know where this logger is used directly um, because to uh, to someone who is new to the project, he will look at that logger, he will try to find where it's used, and he won't find any reference of it anywhere else in your code base. And someone will have to come and spoil the magic that it's actually used by a library which depends on it. So um, that that that's a bit quirky in my opinion. And yeah, but it is possible to achieve. I personally haven't had a use case for that uh, yet. All right, thank you. Um, I think that was our last question in case anyone else is writing one as I speak. So <laughs> and if, if that happens, that's fine. But uh, in the meantime, I just want to say thanks so much for coming. Um, even if it's not in Florence, maybe next year <laughs> will be possible and you get to have that delicious Italian food. Oh, yeah. Well, can't wait, <laughs> really. Um, hope I'll meet you then live, uh, both the organizers and the participants. It was great. Uh, for me this experience and uh, yeah i'll uh, we'll see you again uh, next time yeah yeah and enjoy the rest of golab as well thank you thanks everyone all right take care bye 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 all right, you guys, that was the last talk for GoLab Day 1. Um, again, you want, if you want, you can rate the talk on the agenda page. And uh, just another reminder to slip in there. Uh, we do have a Ask Me Anything going on from, from the Go team on Thursday. So if you have any questions that are not already on that list, um, you can ask your question. You can also just vote on the questions that are there. And this link is in the session in the agenda. So you can find it there as well. All right, we'll be waiting for you all tomorrow for day two of Go Lab. We've got four talks going on. First one is uh, pure, pure Go Unikernels, Go Metal with Tama Go, uh, building a, an FM radio station with Go, building a command line tool as the core of your apps, and running Go on the smallest systems with Tiny Go. 
So I uh, hope to have you all there in the talk. Enjoy the rest of your day and we'll see you then. Thanks. Bye-bye.